trouble home I take In constant sorrow through his day We're going to be in Job chapter 9 today. The title of the message is Job Responds to Bildad the Brutal. Building, we're walking our way through through Job today. As you're turning there, uh, Charlotte and I would just like to thank you. Uh, she's been, she's had shingles and still getting through them. Uh, but y'all have been kind and brought food and all kinds of things and cards and things. So we just, we're thankful for you um, ministering to our family because uh, we are blessed uh, to have each one of you. Thank you for that. And Miss Cricket, thank you for being here. And uh, Lord just blessed us. Amen. And today, at the end of the service, we're going to have our, our offering for family aid. We, we love to be able to help people in need, okay? It's what we do. And we realize we're a big family. And sometimes people have difficulties. And we're here to stand in the gap for that. We're also going to have our fifth Sunday dinner. Now, the Lord uh, does something with the food, right? He not only blesses it, but he multiplies it. So if you didn't bring anything, don't feel bad. Stay. Okay? Stay. We'd love to have you. Fellowship with a bunch of knuckleheads. We'd love to have you. Okay? Um, and today is, is quite an anniversary, Miss Michelle, correct? Um, Michelle Harisco, right here, is six years ago that she had um, her massive stroke. Two of them. And Michelle's always been an overachiever, and so she just did it doubly. And, uh, but she's a testimony of the Lord's power and grace, too, because they had told us that day that she, nothing, it's just, there's no hope, there's no anything good, good that's going to come from this. And uh, Mike and all of us were at the hospital and prayed, and look at her, standing up, doing great. Just, I mean, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. And we're still praying for you, Michelle, every day. You know, God's continuing to do stuff, and, and we're thankful. Amen. Amen. It's going to be in chapter 9 and 10 today, chapters 9 and 10. Last week we talked about uh, Bildad. He gives his speech to Job. He tries to use uh, logic and tradition and nature to convince Job that he was getting exactly what he deserved. All this trouble that Job was in the midst of was his own doing, right? And he kind of approaches it as a, as a lawyer, a prosecuting attorney trying to go after Job, and, and he makes his case for all of this. And today we see Job's going to respond back to Bildad and help him to understand what what he sees that there was a, a shred of truth in what Bildad says, but there's a whole lot of lies in there too. He is coming from the point of defending himself in a way, right? Have you ever been accused of something that you didn't do? Yeah, we've all been there, right? And Job is being accused of something that he didn't do. He begins to defend himself. There's an interesting story the other day I read. There were two high school girls. They had the opportunity to go to a school dance, and, and they decided, they were, they were Christians, and they decided that they wanted to bless their neighbors instead of going to this dance. So these two high school girls decided that they were going to bake cookies, put them on plates, and, and have a little heart that says, you know, Jesus loves you, and then deliver them to every door in the neighborhood of their home. And so, as they started baking cookies, the time went on, and it got later than they thought, and so they didn't start delivering cookies until about 10 o'clock that night. Right? So they were knocking on doors, and some people answered, some people didn't. They would leave them at the doorstep or whatever. One lady, 49-year-old lady next to Two, two houses down from him. Um, she didn't answer the door and she had an anxiety attack. Had to go to the emergency room the next day. And it made her mad that anybody was knocking on her door after 10 o'clock at night. So this lady was so angry that she sued these two girls. 
took them to court, right? And sued them for the cost of her emergency room visit of $900, and she won. She said, oh, I just wanted to show these girls that, that they shouldn't be out that, that late at night because bad things can happen to them. Well, indeed, you can get sued by your neighbor lady that's mean-spirited. That's a bad thing, right? But you see, it ended up as a good story because a lot of people found out about it, and they just started giving those girls money, and they paid their, their $900 that, that, that she owed them, and the money kept coming in, and so started two college funds for these ladies. So God's good, right? And we see here that, that Job is beginning to get tired of all the things that people are saying about him, right? If you've been talked about, you know, low down, dirty dog kind of stuff, he, he's tired of it. And he's going to respond here to Bildad. And let's begin in chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And we're going to see what he says here. Then Job answered, yes, I know what you've said is true, but how can a person be justified before God? If one wanted to take him to court, he could not answer God once in a thousand times. God is wise and all-powerful. Who has opposed him and come out unharmed? He removes mountains without their knowledge, overturning them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place so that its pillars, are, its pillars tremble. He commands the sun not to shine and seals off the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens and, trend, and treads on the waves of the sea. He makes the stars, the bear, Orion, the Pleiades, the constellations of the southern sky. He does great and unsearchable things, wonders without number. If he passes by me, I wouldn't see him. If he goes right by, I wouldn't recognize him. If he snatches something, who can stop him? Who can ask him, what are you doing? God does not hold back his anger. Rahab's assistants cringe in fear beneath him. How then can I answer him or choose my arguments against him? Even if I were in the right, I could not answer. I could only beg my judge for mercy. If I'd summoned him and he answered me, I do not believe it, he, that he would pay attention to what I said. He batters me with the whirlwind and multiplies my wounds without cause. He does not let me catch my breath, but soaks me with bitter experiences. If it is a matter of strength, look, he is the mighty one. If it is a matter of justice, who can summon him? Even if I were in the right, my own mouth would condemn me. If I were blameless, my mouth would declare me guilty. We'll begin there today. Job has listened to everything that Bildad said, and he begins here saying, yes, verse 2, I know what you said is true. The first line there in your listening outline is guilty. He's listening, and he says he's not agreeing with him that he is a secret sinner and has some things to repent, but he is agreeing that God is awesome and that he is just a mortal man. He goes on and says, if, if, how can a person be justified before God? He's turning, he's using all these legal terms. The word justified there is a term meaning declared not guilty. He said, how can I come before God who knows everything? Everything I've ever thought, every hair on my head, every, how can I come before God, take him to court, and have him declare me not guilty? He said, if you were to take him to court, he could not answer God once in a thousand times. He's saying, how could I, how could we as humans ever come in a court of law before a God that is perfect and holy and righteous? He, he removes mountains without their knowledge. He shakes the earth from its place. He commands the sun not to shine so, and then seals off the stars. He has put everything into place. How can I, little old me, human, created by God, how can we take God to court and win? See, it's an important point that he makes here. And let's remember, Job, we believe, was a contemporary of Abraham. Okay, he was, uh, about, he was before Moses. We believe Job is the oldest book written in Scripture. And Job here deals with something that is a foundational truth for those who believe in God, is that we are all inherently guilty. 
You see, that rubs against the nature of, of a worldview that is not Christian. Okay, this worldview, the understanding that we as people, we are born into this world as sinners. Because of what happened in the garden, Adam and Eve sinned against a holy and perfect God, and his curse, his sin, goes down through all people forever until the return of the king to take us with him and the culmination of, of history as we know it. But you see that we live in a world that, and this is not a new thing, right? This is what they've been dealing with all of history, is that there are people who believe that we are inherently good people when we're born, right? That when we come out of the womb, that we're good people, and that society and all of these evils in the world make us into bad people, right? Two different worldviews, complete opposites of understanding, right? We believe we're inherently sinners, as we're told by the Lord, and here we see him make the case. How can we how can we come and, and bring a case against God and be found not guilty? How is that possible? And he says, it is not possible. Not possible. It says that he does unsearchable things, wonders without number. I think too many times we have a, a limited view of God. We like to bring God down to our size. Right? We... Describe him as a, a gentlemanly grandfather sitting on his throne with the long beard and the, the cane, right? The, and you can just run and jump on his lap and, and all of that. We personify God like that in many ways because we want to bring him down to our level because he's not so scary. But you see, when we do that, we minimize God's awesomeness and his holiness and his perfection. I mean, just look at night. Just go outside and look at the stars and know that God created every one of those. I mean, with all of our technology and advancements, we can't even see to the furthest reaches of, of the galaxies and the universe. God has done all that. But yet, he put this earth on its axis just perfectly. And it spins at the perfect rate. And he put us, people that he created out of dirt. And then he blew into our body's life. And we have the audacity as the created beings to think that we have any kind of equality with God, that we could bring him to court and accuse him of the way he's been treating us. You see, the truth of the matter is that we're guilty. Job realized it. He realized all of these things that you're saying, God is awesome, he is wonderful, he is amazingly powerful. How can I as a human make a good case against God? You see, when we argue with God a lot of times, that's what we're doing. We're taking him to court in our own mind and saying, God, you don't know what you're doing. Look at the evidence, Lord, of all these things in my life. There's evidence that you are not doing the right thing by me. And God says, you don't see the whole picture. We forget that there is a, and we won't see this until the end of the book. Verse, uh, chapter 38, God shows up. Here, Job says, I don't even think God's listening to me. Well, let me tell you, God was listening to him the whole time. Chapter 38, God shows up and starts to ask Job some questions. And then we'll see at the end of the book that there was a purpose to the suffering. You see, he is admitting first and foremost that he could not be someone who, who presents a valid case against God. He is guilty. We need to understand that as a people. Right? It, it, it changes how we deal with God if we realize that he is holy, 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 and that we are not. That we are created beings that have fallen, 
that we fall for sin, our, our propensity is to sin. As long as we're in this flesh suit, we deal. We, our spirit wars with our flesh every day. Are we going to pray? Or are we going to do this? Are we going to, are, are we going to love? Or are we going to hate? Are we going to, are we going to encourage? Or are we going to bring down somebody? All these choices we have every day, there is a war that we fight against. And if we are filled with the spirit of God in us, we win those wars more often than we lose. But it begins with the understanding that we are guilty and that we need God. You see, if, if we believe that we're inherently good people and that society and, and the evils of the world make us bad people, then it points to the fact that we don't need God, really. We just need to make these things better so that life will get better. Everybody wants to make laws against this and regulate this and protest this and do all these things. And indeed, they are, they are using their energy to try to get something done, but they are doing it from the perspective that if we do these things on earth, we can legislate holiness and morality. You can't do that. Drugs are against the law, but still people use drugs. Abuse. Every kind of abuse is still against the law. There are laws on the books, but so why do people still abuse? DWI, it's, a, it's against the law. But why do people still drink and drive if that law is there? You see, we can't do it. If we understand that we are guilty from the beginning, then it helps us and points us directly to God. God is the only solution to our fallenness, to our guilt. Right? Not everything else. We can't make this world a perfect place because it is a fallen world because of sin. Then we are not only guilty, but the world is guilty. There was a seminary student had a had an assignment to go and look at and visit other churches and then write reports on all these different churches. And so he found a church in a neighboring town that he had never been to. And so he makes a, a, a jaunt over there on a Sunday evening and goes to church over there. And when he was coming out of church, he, he takes a ride on what he thought was a country road. He gets it about up to 40, 45 miles an hour and he gets pulled over. The man pulls him over and says, you realize that the speed limit's 25. He said, but there wasn't a sign. I didn't see a sign anywhere. And because I was in this area, I just thought that, that it was a country road. And I know that, the, that in this state, country roads, small two-lane roads, it's 40 miles an hour. And he, he thought, I'm going to do it. And they said, well, sir, if you, know, if you feel that strongly, you can appeal to the judge. And he said, I'm going to. So this seminary student, uh, he, he appeals to the judge. He gets a court date. He comes in there. He's all dressed up. He has his arguments all set out. He's ready to just go and lay everything out against the judge, right? He gets in there. Bailiff comes in. All rise. Everybody stands up. And the judge comes in with his robes and sitting on the high bench. And, and he's standing there. And, and the court reporter gives his name and, and lists his charges. Then the judge asked him one thing. He said, sir, do you have something to say in your defense? And this young man sat there for a second, stood there for a second, and he thought, you know what? According to the laws, I'm guilty. I'm here before a judge in the awesomeness of this whole interaction. And I'm arguing a point that is invalid because I was going over the speed limit. He said all this flooded his mind at the moment when the judge asked him if he had something to say. And he said all I could blurt out was, no, sir. <laughs> he realized at that moment that even if his intentions weren't to break the speed limit, that 40 miles an hour was over 25 miles an hour. He was 15 miles over. And that even though he didn't do it maliciously, he was still breaking the law. We have to realize as people that no matter if we have intent to sin or not intent to sin, that it is all sin and that we are all guilty. Job sets that forth here. 
It's biblical. It's scriptural all through. You see, the reason that, that we are guilty is because we cannot measure up to God's perfect holiness. He goes on. The next thing we see, beginning in verse 21, is his, he's turned to be bitter. Right? Job has become bitter. Though I am blameless, I no longer care about myself. I renounce my life. It is all the same. Therefore, I say, he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When disaster brings death, he mocks the despair of the innocent. He's speaking of God here. The earth is handed over to the wicked. He blindfolds its judges. If it isn't he, then who is it? My days fly by faster than a runner. They flee without seeing any good. They sweep by like boats made of papyrus, like an eagle swooping down on its prey. If I said, I will forget my complaint and change my expression and smile, I would still live in terror of all my pains. I know you will not acquit me. Since I will be found guilty, why should I labor in vain? If I wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, then you dip me in a pit of mud and my own clothes despise me. All of chapter 10 is him complaining in, in bitterness against God. I am disgusted with my life. I will express my complaint and speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not declare me guilty. Let me know what you, why you prosecute me. Is it good for you to oppress, to reject the work of your hands and favor the plans of the wicked? Do you have eyes of flesh or do you see as a human sees? Are your days like that of a human or your years like those of a man? That you look for my wrongdoing and search for my sin? Even though you know that I am not wicked and there is no one who can deliver, who can deliver from your hand. Your hands shape me and form me. Will you now turn and destroy me? Please remember that you formed me like clay. Will you now return me to the dust? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? Your clothe, you clothed me with skin and flesh. You wove me together with bones and tendons. You gave me life and faithful love and your care has guarded my life. Yet, you conceal these thoughts in your heart. I know this, is, this was your hidden plan. If a sin, you would notice and would not acquit me of my wrongdoing. If I am wicked, woe to me. And if I am righteous, I cannot lift up my head. I am filled with shame and aware of my affliction. If I am proud, you hunt me like a lion. Again, display your miraculous power against me. You produce new witnesses against me and multiply your anger toward me. Hardships assault me, wave after wave. Why did you bring me out of the womb? I should have died and never been seen. I wish I'd never existed but had been carried from the womb to the grave. Are my days not a few? Stop it. Leave me alone so that I can smile a little before I go to the land of darkness and gloom, never to return. It is a land of blackness like the deepest darkness, gloomy and chaotic, where even the light is like the darkness. Job's buddies have not helped his view of God he has become bitter at this point. He is complaining against God. Why? Why did you make me if I have to go through all of this? Why, God? If even though I say the right things, you still get me. You still strike me down. God, why are you doing this to me? These are some of the strongest words that Job speaks in all of these things. He's sitting in the garbage dump with three friends that are not really friends. He's scraping the boils on his skin. He's lost everything. No one wants to be a part of his life, and the three guys that are sitting there are just accusing him, one right after the other. You are loaded. You've sinned. I can see how he could become bitter here. If we're not careful in the midst of hard times and trouble, we will give in to bitterness and begin to go against the God who really does love us. God does not hunt us down to shoot us with his arrows. 
God is our protector, our strong foundation. He is our high tower. He is our refuge and strength. He is our peace and our love and our joy. He is everything that we need. He does not change. He is not different in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He is not changed like the shadows turn. He is the God that has been good from the beginning and will continue to be good in this lifetime and he will continue to be good forever and ever and ever. We cannot lose sight of the fact that God does not change just because of the things that we go through. Understand, he is not affected by our hardship. It does not change him. Yet, like a loving father, he sits with us, he cares for us. Even though we go through the trouble, he loves us and walks with us through it. Bitterness can take hold if we're not careful, Job says, I could wash myself clean. I could do all these things, but you just dip me in a pit of mud. All my efforts, God, are, are just thwarted by you. You see, bitterness can take root, and you have to be careful because if you begin to complain to God about his injustice, and please, you, if, you, if you want to, do it. God is not affected by your complaint. Do it. But understand that he will make his case for you later. Bitterness will take hold in a small way and it can grow insidiously and put its roots down in your heart and in your spirit. And before you know it, you grow to be a bitter person. Never happy about anything. Always complaining about everything, even the good things. Boy, aren't those birds singing beautifully today? Yeah, but they're too loud. Before you know it, you'll be yelling at people, get off my lawn. There was a tragic story. There was a family in the, mid, in the Midwest. All of the kids in the family came down with devastating illness. Several of the children died. The rest of the family suffered permanent brain damage. Nobody in the community could find out what was wrong until they started to do some research and they brought in some investigators. They found that the father, they were, he was on his way to work and he found that there was a huge uh, pile of discarded corn next to the road. And so he decides to, to, to get some of that corn. So he pulls his truck up and he loads up that corn in the back of his truck, takes it home, and he fed it to his hogs. Well, these hogs ate all of the corn, and what they didn't realize was this, this corn had been treated with all kinds of chemicals so that it wouldn't be eaten by bugs. But when the hogs ate the corn, it didn't affect the hogs, but when they took the hogs to slaughter and they ate the hogs for breakfast, they were affected by all of the pesticides and everything that the, that the corn had been treated with. If we're not careful, bitterness can be like that corn. We don't see it coming. And we continue to complain and be bitter against the Lord and, and go against Him. And before you know it, it manifests itself in our lives. And we are just downtrodden and broken because we have no hope and we are bitter about how God is treating us. We have to be careful. The last thing that we need to see today is chapter 9, beginning in verse 32 through 35. Job is saying all of these things. He's wanting to understand why this is going on. And he said these four verses that should catch our eye. Job says in verse 32, For he is not a man like me that I can answer him, that we can take each other to court. There is no one to judge between us, to lay his hand on the both of us. Let him take his rod away from me so his terror will no longer frighten me. Then I would speak and not fear him. But that is not the case. I am on my own. Here, Job is saying that he needs a mediator. A mediator. In those days, you see here, it says, there's no one to judge, to mediate between us, to lay his hand on the both of us. What they would do in this time is they would go to the city gate and they would pick somebody, an elder, okay, that had no connection to either of the two in the dispute. 
and he would ask them to be the mediator. And he would hear this side of the story, and he would hear this side of the story, and then he would put his hands, when he made a judgment, he would put his hands on the shoulders of the two people seeking mediation. And he would make his judgment, and that judgment was final. He put his hands on the shoulders and said, this is what I see. And Job is saying that there is no one. He said, who is God? Is he a man that, I, that, that we can judge between the two of us? No. He's saying here that there is not a mediator between God and man to represent us. You see, what is so incredible here is that here Job is already pointing to the mediator that is Christ. Pointing to our Savior, Jesus, right here. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, There is only one God and one mediator between God and men, Jesus Christ. One mediator. You see, how can we bring charges against him? And how can he bring charges against us? Because he is God and we are not. And how can we, how can we bridge that gap? You see, if you've got a king that's bringing a charge against a, a, a poor man... Right? The king would say, I've got a friend that's a good king and he's wise and, and I will have him come and mediate for this. But the poor man says, no, no, no. He has no idea about being poor. He doesn't know what I put up with. And so I've got a buddy that's poor. He can represent me and he can be the mediator. And the king says, no, no, no. He, he has no idea what it means to be a king. And so there was a stalemate. They could not find a mediator that would understand both sides of the conundrum until Christ came. You see, the problem is that in the garden, in the beginning, man walked with God and God walked with man in perfect harmony. God would come and walk in the cool of the night and he would talk to Adam and Eve and they would have uninterrupted fellowship. But then Satan tempted Eve and Adam they wanted to be like God, and so they chose to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When they ate of that fruit, they realized that they were naked. And next time God came to visit, they went and hid themselves. The fellowship was broken now between God and man. God said, I will take care of you. He said, but I'm kicking you out of the garden. So... God said, I will clothe you. So he slayed an animal, the first sacrifice known to man. He slayed an animal to make clothes for them. And he kicked them out of Eden forever. At that point, when sin entered the world, there was a great gulf. There was a great divide between God and man. And there's no way that they could get back to God. This this chasm, this gorge was, was so vast that, that there was nothing that could be put between them for man to get to God. There was no mediator. In the Old Testament, we see that God used prophets and priests and kings to lead his people. God would speak through the priest and through the prophets for his people and lead them. He gave them a system by which they could make sacrifices to atone for their sin, but it would only happen for a year and they had to go back. There was no sacrifice that could be more than a year. And so they would over and over have to make amends for their sin. That would assuage God's wrath for another year for the people. But looking forward, God knew exactly what was needed. He needed to bridge the gap himself. Only God could bridge the gap. You see, man, since the beginning, since the fall, man has been trying to build a bridge to get to God. One of the bridges that, that's been used is, is religion. Right? If I just do the right thing, if I say the right thing, if I put my rear in a pew enough, if I read the Bible enough, if, if I do all, then, then that religion will get me to God, but it always falls short. Because it's a man-made bridge. Never reaches God. 
Good works is also another one that's tried to, tried to be used. All these things that man has tried over the years to try to get to God has always failed. And the person is always precariously at the end of that bridge and falls off without a mediator. God is all perfect and holy. Who could represent us both? Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, who was born of a virgin. He was fully God and fully, fully man. He was not half God and half man. He was fully God and fully man. And he lived on this earth and he experienced hunger and thirst. He experienced everything that we have experienced in this life, even more. And then he began to have a ministry among the people telling them who he is. That he was the very son of God. Just come to me. Don't trust the religion. Don't trust all these other things. Put away your little gods. They're just made of stone and wood. Just put your faith in me. I am the great mediator between God and man. For that, all those that love their religion and love their idols and love their money and love their fine clothes, they said, we ain't going to put up with this. We're going to hang him on a cross. So they did. He took the beating, the nails that we all deserve because he was perfect and holy. He was without sin. And yet because of the wrath of God has to be, has to be assuaged, it has to be paid for. No longer would we have to, to sacrifice every year because the blood would not wash away our sins for eternity. Only the blood of Christ shed on Calvary is the only sacrifice that lasts for eternity. Amen. You see that bridge between God and man was a bridge made of rough hewn wood. In the shape of a cross where man could now get to God because of Christ Jesus, the mediator, the one who is fully God and fully man, the one who has taken the price for sin. He took it upon himself and didn't tell us to do it so that we have access to God. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple that separated everyone from the holy of holies was torn from the top down Amen. to show that it was God that tore the veil and no longer was there a barrier between man and God. No longer. Amen. When you pray today, you don't have to pray through a person. You pray to God because of what Jesus did for us. You don't have to go confession to me or to any man. You go directly to God. Jesus is the perfect mediator. He's the one that can put his hand on my shoulder as a human. Put his hand on God the Father and make the judgment. Because he is the perfect mediator for us. You see, we have to understand that we need a mediator for our salvation. You can't be good enough, just what Job is saying. I can't be good enough to, to bring a case against God. I can't be good enough to, to win even one argument. I can't even answer him because he is the God that made everything. How can I even stand before a holy God? God says, I'll tell you what, I'll make a way. And he did. God does not say that we're going to be gods of this or gods of that. He says we are his sons and daughters of the king. Now, how do we, how do we call upon this mediator? Does God tell us to clean ourselves up to, before we come into the presence of the mediator and the father? He says, no. He says, you come before me. I'm the one that will clean you up. You see, too many times we put off wanting to follow the Lord because we think, well, I've got to get some things changed in my life. Whew, God, whew, the things I've done in my life, I need to clean some of this up and get on the right path before I come to God. But the iron ironic thing is you can't get on the right path. 
your bridge will still fall short reaching to God every time. God is the one that saves us and cleans us up. It says he takes us out of the miry muck and he puts us upon the rock and he cleans us off through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Not by what we've done, it is by grace that we're saved. Through faith, which is a gift of God, so that no man can boast. If we think that we are inherently good people that are ruined by the world, we take grace away It is not possible to have grace when we think that we are inherently good people. Amen. And that if we just change society and we change the world, then everything will work out. That is the opposite of grace. Amen. But God's grace is amazing. Amen. Job here understands with the depth of his soul that he is guilty, that he needs a mediator, even though he's bitter in his heart. Who's your mediator today? Who's your mediator? If you're not in Christ, if you have not put your faith in the Lord, if you are not a Christian, you are your own mediator. You get to argue the case before God when you come to the end of your life. I hope you're prepared for that. Because as Job, a righteous man, said, I can't even bring a charge against God. If you don't know the Lord, if you've never put your faith in Him, then you will be responsible to answer God for every sin that you've ever committed. And God, being righteous and holy and just in all of His ways, He cannot, he cannot turn His back on sin because He is righteous and holy. He will judge you guilty. He sentenced us, apart from Christ, the sentence is eternity without Him, which is in Scripture called hell. But you see, when we turn and put our faith in Him and repent and say, God, I can't do it on my own. Forgive me for thinking that I can do it, that I can build a bridge to get to you. Forgive me, God. You are the Son of God. You know what He does? He embraces us. He wraps his arm around us. He cleans us up. He puts his, the, the Holy Spirit within us. He says, never again will you have to answer for your sins. Because they were paid for on the cross. Amen. And then, he's not done with us. He walks with us every second of every day forever. In the good times and the bad times and every time, he is with us. But sometimes we go back to our old ways, don't we? Even as Christians, we want to be our own mediator. So we don't pray, right? If we, let me just ask you, that's one of the greatest indicators of our dependency upon God, how much we pray. If you don't pray very much, okay, if you just pray maybe in your car or maybe a second here or there or over your dinner, if you just pray very little, then that shows that you are very dependent upon yourself and not God. One of the greatest indicators, you can only answer that yourself. If your prayer life stinks and you just pray every once in a great while, you're depending upon yourself. You have become your own mediator because you're not asking God for his wisdom and understanding. You see, as believers, we have to be dependent upon him, not just at dinner, not just when we're in trouble. We have to be dependent upon every moment of every day Amen. on a God who loves us and gave everything for us. Amen. Today, if you don't know the Lord, we're about to have a time where the praise team will come up and you can come and we will introduce you to Jesus. We can't save you. Only God can do that. I can't pray for you. God will lead you in that. He draws you to himself. He will change you completely. I love that the scripture says that he makes us new creation. Right? The old Tao was gone. When he saved me, he made me the new Tao. With the new Tao smell. 
saved by God, not saved by my works. Amen. 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 Saved by His grace, and I've seen His mercies, and I have seen His guidance. And it never grows old the closer we come to Him because He gets better and better. It's not that He changes, it's that we, we gain knowledge as we walk with Him and love Him and we see Him moving in our lives. Amen. If you don't know the Lord, I invite you, put your faith in Christ. And I tell you, as believers, if, if you've walked away from the Lord, if you've not walked with Him for a very long time, come back. He's always waiting with open arms. Right. Romans 8.1 tells us, For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. What that means is, when you walk away from the Lord and come back, He's not standing there with His arms up saying, It's about time. Why don't you stop and, and just drop, give me 20, and then I'll take you back. <laughs> God doesn't say that. Amen. When we come back to the Lord, He's saying, come on. Amen. Oh, I've been waiting for you for so long. But you had to figure out on your own that you can't do it without me. And then He snatches us up. And He gives us a hug that we'll never forget. That's the kind of God that we serve. Today, whatever the reason is that you're here, God's brought you here. It's not that you were drugged by somebody else. God brought you here to hear the truth of His Word. Now's the time to do whatever He calls you to do. Jesus says, those who love me will do what I say. There is an action that accompanies our faith and our belief in Christ. What does he want you to do today? You may be here and you don't know the Lord. He wants you to be saved. He doesn't want you to wait. That's right. He wants you to know him. If you're a believer, don't wait to come back to the Lord because he's waiting for you. Amen. Whatever it is, do it today. Amen. Let's pray. Glorious Father, we thank you that you have provided a mediator, the very fully God and fully man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We ask you today, Lord, save those that are lost. Lord, those that have walked away, that you will become prominent in their life again, that they will have a hunger and a thirst for you. Lord, help us. Help each of us, Lord, to depend on you. Take this time of invitation, and you move in our hearts. We plead with you, Father, move. Move in our hearts. And we ask this in the beautiful the name that is above all names, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.